You might recall from high school physics that light exhibits characteristics of both particles and waves. Some of the properties of light are better understood in the terms of one or the other. For example, brightness is a function of the number of particles of light, of photons, arriving per unit time. Whereas colour is a wave-like property that depends on the wavelength or frequency of those particles. For a given colour, increased brightness means that more photons are arriving, not that the individual photons are themselves brighter. Note that I am being incredibly slipshod with the terminology that I'm using just at the moment. As we'll discuss in a little while, colour and brightness are both really perceptual properties, not properties of the light itself at all. But they are a useful shorthand for discussing properties of light precisely because they reflect our subjective experiences. The energy of a photon depends on its wavelength or reciprocally on its frequency. Short wavelength photons have high frequencies and high energies. Long wavelengths have lower frequencies and lower energies. High energy photons can be damaging to biological tissues, while lower energies can be more difficult to detect and broadly require larger detecting apparatus in order to separate out the signal from the noise. That roughly 400 to 700 nanometer range of visible light represents a kind of Goldilocks zone of relatively harmless detectability in the context of human physiology. It's important to note that visibility is not a physical property of the light itself. There's nothing special about those wavelengths. It's a reflection of our own physiology. That we can see that range is just how things are for us and other animals will have somewhat different ranges. So light travels in straight lines more or less at famously a constant speed in a vacuum. That is, matter complicates the picture in a number of different ways. Usefully, we can think of the speed varying according to the medium that the light is passing through. Changes in the medium induce changes in the speed and those in turn induce path changes. We can see this in phenomena like heat haze, where fluctuations in the density of the air through which the light is passing lead to wobbling of the images that we see but in particular crossing over distinct boundaries between different media, say from the air into a piece of glass or into water, can change the direction in which the light is traveling. We call this refraction and it turns out to be super important. If we want to use light as a medium for gathering information about the outside world, it's helpful to know where it's coming from. It's not absolutely essential. There may still be some value in having a more generalized sense of lightness or darkness, and there are some animals that do just that. But it's only really a, a small fraction of what we generally would think of as vision. Assuming we have some kind of light detector, perhaps some silver nitrate on a film or plate or a photodiode or a nerve cell containing photosensitive pigments. If light reaches that detector simultaneously from different locations in the world, then the information from each location will just kind of pile up together in the detector's response and we won't be able to tell which bit of it came from where. It will all be blurred together. What we would like is some kind of spatial organization so that all of the light from one point over here goes to one point in our detection apparatus and all of the light from everywhere else goes to other places. One way to do this is to restrict the possible straight line paths of the light by making it all pass through a single point in space. 
a pinhole aperture. All the light arriving at any detection location must have come from the direction of the pinhole because there's nowhere else to go. This kind of setup is nice and simple and it does occur in nature, especially in simpler organisms. But it has the disadvantage of capturing only a tiny fraction of the potentially available light because most of the possible paths are blocked. This discards a lot of potentially useful information and reduces the signal to noise ratio. An alternative is to have a larger aperture and then use refraction at the curved surface boundary of a lens to bring the light traveling by different pathways from some location out there together to a focus point at the detector. Lens systems are harder to build than pinholes. Both for human engineers and for biology, they have more complicated functional parts, but they allow for the capture of more of the available light and hence more of the available information. The detector at one specific focused point has good information about one single location out in the world. If we have many detectors at many locations, each gathering information about their own little point out in the world, that gives us a spatial map of a whole visual field, which is to say an image. Of course, focus is not perfect and not the same everywhere. Lenses will only bring to focus some parts of the external world, some range of distances away from the lens. Detectors at well-focused points will get strongly localised information. Those where the focus is less good will receive light from a broader range of locations and the information will be correspondingly less clear and more blurry. We are probably all familiar with this kind of locally focused imaging from our use of cameras, which combine uh, a lens system for light capture and focusing with some kind of spatial array of detectors, such as a film frame or a CCD, to do the actual image capture. Human vision is quite unlike photography in a variety of rather important ways. But there are also enough structural similarities in the early stages of the visual system that cameras are at least analogically useful as a way of starting to think about eyes.